Okay, na good afternoon sa inyo lahat. And we are passing out notes. Um, ang problema lang sa mga ganitong pastors conference, pag nakakuha ng notes, eh itunuturo uli sa iba. Huwag niyo pong itong ituro. Ang gusto po sana namin, gawin ninyo to. Okay? Okay? Kasi alam ko na iniisip niyo, iniisip ko, naku, pagka nakakuha ka ng mga, ano, ituturo ko to. Hindi po to para ituro. Ang kailangan po namin, gagamitin natin to as a strategy so that we can fulfill the goal of topic for, for 10,000 uh, pastoral trainers. Okay? Nagkakasundo ba tayo? Okay? Ready kayo? Okay. So we are passing this out. And please observe uh, courtesy. So may mga copyright and we're trying to publish this under GPRO Commission. So please uh, use it. Go ahead and use it. But please uh, don't forget to, don't publish it online. All right? Because we're reserving the right to publish that for the GPRO Commission. Okay. Uh, one of our recurring team parate sa uh, events na to is that pastoral health affects church health. And church health affects societal health. Alright? Pero pag tinanong mo yung asawa ko, sasabihin niya, your health is largely dependent on your my happiness. <laughs> Tama, di ba? <laughs> so, my wife would say, happy wife, happy pastor, and happy pastor makes for happy pasture. And if you want to remain alive, keep your wife happy. Uh, that's, I think, another topic for a different occasion. Maybe we can gather together for... Um, uh, talking about our wives and, and uh, family life, okay? But that's not our talk for today. Today, we're going to talk about uh, pastoral training, pastoral leaders and pastoral trainers, okay? Uh, before we talk about pastoral uh, leaders and pastoral trainers, let's talk about formal theological education, non-formal and informal theological education. What's the difference? Anong difference ng formal, non-formal, informal education? May nagsabi sa akin, Pastor, ang difference niyan, pag tinawag kitang Dr. Tan, formal. Pag Pastor Jason, non-formal. Pag high bro, informal yun. <laughs> Pero, <laughs> okay, some people think na the difference between formal and non-formal and formal theological education has to do with uh, teaching style. It has nothing to do with teaching style. Because people sa formal education would, would argue na kami rin nagtuturo as best as we can, as effective as we can, as, as relevant as we can. Okay? It's not true that only the non-formal teaches relevant subjects. Okay? Formal and non-formal have that desire to communicate properly, to teach properly, to be relevant, to be effective. Okay? The main difference between the two, between formal and non-formal and informal theological education has to do with your goal. And the goal of formal theological education is to finish a degree. Okay. Yung iba sinasabi, eh kami, hybrid kami, pareho. Paano mo ginawa yun? Yung isa nga magtatapos ng degree, yung isa walang degree yun. Tapos pareho, ano yun? Nagsimula ka, tapos hindi mo tinapos. Maraming ganun eh, di ba? Sisimula, pero hindi tinapos. Pero hindi pwede yun. Formal theological education always focuses on accomplishing a degree. Okay? A required degree. Ano naman tawag din sa mga pastor na kumukuha lang ng degree pero ayaw mag-aral? Yun yung mga nagbabayad ng doctoral degree, okay? <laughs> Alam mo, pagka ganun ka, ganun ginagawa mo, ha? nagbabayad ka, o kaya naghahanap ka ng tatlong buwan lang, may doctoral degree ka na. Alam mo tawag doon? Okay? Meron kang heart problem. Tama? Let's take it seriously, right? That is a heart issue. Sabi ko nga, may PhD daw ako, permanent head damage. And one of our speakers, Dr. Ramesh, will come at tomorrow. He has a PhD. Total heart damage. And for most of you, Adimin is a what? damage minister. <laughs> Pero ewan ko. <laughs> but, okay, that's, that's, let's make it clear. Formal theological education, you have to finish the degree. Non-formal is not required. You're not required to finish the degree. But there's still a format, there's a program. There are things that you have to follow through the program. May mga subject and modules that you have to take. So pareho lang sila. Yung isa lang nga is leading for a formal degree. You follow? Yung informal. Walang subject yun. You're doing that through counseling, mentoring, 
pursuit. And all three is needed for you to grow. You need to grow through all these this, uh, avenues. Now, some of you might not have any capacity or any access or any opportunity to do formal theological education. And this is what I always tell, tell people. Kung wala ka, if you don't have any opportunity, any capacity to do formal theological education and yet God has called you to do the ministry, don't worry about it. Because God will use you as you are. Okay? But if the Lord opened an opportunity for you to study, then go ahead and study. Right? Both of them can be used by God mightily. Paul was formally trained. Peter wasn't trained. But both of them were used by God the same way. Right? Amen? Amen. Okay. So yung mga may degree, huwag kayo masyadong mayabang. Doon naman sa mga walang degree, huwag naman kayo masyadong mainggit. Okay. Kasi you're being called in different situation. Remember, there are people who doesn't have a degree who can minister to people in different ways that the person with the degree cannot. And those people who has a, non, uh, has a formal degree can do some things for the body of Christ that people who doesn't have a degree uh, cannot do it. We need each other Amen. to help out. Parang sundalo yan, eh, no? Mayroong kang sargento, mayroong kang tiniente. Yung tiniente, may college degree. Kadalasan, okay? Yung mga uh, PMA year, pagsalta niyan, tapos niya ng college degree niya, ano? Tiniente na siya, di ba? Pero pagdating niyan sa field, gera, gusto mo ba sumunod dun? Walang experience. Hindi ko gusto niyon, di ba? Ang gusto kong sundan, yung sargento na walang college degree, pero limang taon na sa gera. Pero you need both. Because not everything can be solved practically. There will be times when you need new ideas, new concept to bring you out of a thick situation. And that is where theories come in. So yung mga non-formal, they focus on skill development. Okay? For the formal, they focus on theoretical ideas. Both of them are needed if you want to be a healthy pastor and a healthy trainer. Okay? Okay. Let's go to pastoral leadership journey matrix. When we're talking about pastoral leadership journey, usually, how do you train a pastor to become a better pastor? How do you lead them training? And we've been asking this question for a while. Ang hirap kasing itindin. Ano bang kailangan ng group na to? What do they need? At kung wala tayong matrix, nakaka- ang hirap malaman kung anong kailangan nila. Now, this matrix is not the only matrix that you can use. Actually, you can develop your own matrix. Dinevelop lang namin to so that it can help us with our ministry. Pero we're not saying that this is this can account for everything that happens in a pastor's life. Alright? Hindi namin sinasabi yan, ha? Maliwanag tayo? Okay, this is one of the model, and it's healthy for us to have multiple models when understanding, when we're trying to understand how leaders are developed. Okay. Now, in this matrix, we have divided in into uh, four, uh, I mean, two dimension. So this is a Johari window, but actually I didn't get it from there. I got it from uh, Ken Blanchard. Ken Blanchard came up with a, what they call situational leadership uh, matrix like this one, if you're familiar with that. Um, and then we, I took it from that idea and then came up with this different kinds of dimension. Para sa amin, na-realize na amin, yung isang pastor, one pastor is very effective if he has leadership competence. Do you agree? Okay. And he has theological competence. Alright? Yun ang minimum para sa amin. Regardless of what his heart is, we're assuming that every, every pastor has a good heart. Okay, but that's a, a, a different topic and a different uh, system. But re- right now, we're trying to measure effectivity of a pastor, and we have these two components. Ano uli yun? Sa baba, leadership competence, and second is theological competence. So we divided this into four. So we came up with this uh, criteria, description of a uh, pastor, pastoral leader. So if you're a pastoral leader, you're starting off bago ko pa lang sa ministry, alright? Wala ka pa masyadong leadership competence, konti pa lang. You're starting out on that side, low leadership competence and low theological competence, lalo na kung wala ka pang training. Alright? Now, as you develop, uh, some people would become a, wants to become a pastor and the Lord brought them into a pastoral ministry even without formal theological education, but they're very good in leadership skills. Then we make him as a lay practitioner. 
If I know, what's the first one? Novice. The second one is lay practitioner. Now, what about those uh, seminary graduates, Bible school graduates, high school graduate, went into a Bible school, finished a bachelor's degree, and now after that is now pastoring a church? Usually we call them the theoretical guys. Okay? They have all these theoretical ideas, good ideas to pastor a church, but they lack leadership competence. But they're very good in theological competence, right? Okay, so we call them as theoretical. But what we want is for them to move to, to journey towards this seasoned pastor, where we have a pastor who has both leadership and theological competence. And theological competence doesn't mean that you can only get it when you take formal theological education. Even if you don't have formal theological education, you can still reach uh, that, that uh, be, you can still be a seasoned leader. Okay, if you study on your own, you have the initiative to read, you have the initiative to think, to write, to engage theologically. And whenever you attend a lot of seminars then uh, in theology, somehow it helps you build up to capacity. Okay? But Bawat, every, every single one has his own needs. Okay? And we will go to those needs. The need of a novice is extensive mentoring and training in theology, leadership, and pastoral ministry. Do you have that in your notes? Yan ang needs. So for a novice, if you're training or okay, you're mentoring a new pastor, anong gagawin natin? Bago pa lang siya, wala pa siyang leadership ability, uh, training, kulang pa siya theological competence. Kailangan niya ng extensive mentoring and training in theology, leadership, and pastoral ministry. So susubayabayan mo siya. Okay? Samahan mo siya sa ministry niya as he builds up capacity. So we have a lot of younger leaders. Ang problema, you know what's happening? They're doing the ministry on their own. And that's not healthy for them. A healthy pastor is always somebody, at least we know, that community has a big impact sa life niya. Parate. If you see a leader doesn't have a community, most often than not, yung leader na yun, may issue yun. May issue yun. Okay? So if you want to be a healthy pastor, you have to have a healthy community. The second one is a lay practitioner. Anong need niya? Because he has, uh, he has limited theoretical knowledge in theology, he needs coaching in biblical and theological areas. Alright? So yun naman ang isusupply mo. If you're a seasoned leader, try to provide that training for them. Paano kung hindi mo kayang ibigay yun sa kanya? Then you look for some opportunities for him to develop theological and biblically. Okay? Okay, sec- third, Theoretical. He has extensive theoretical knowledge, but he needs help when it comes to pastoral experience. So you coach him in leadership or pastoral skills or mentoring in life situations. Ang problema ng mentoring natin, nagiging meeting lang yan. Meeting tayo ng meeting, tapos wala na yung M, eating na lang. Eating, eating, di ba? Tama. Okay. Kasi nawawala na yung goal ng mentoring. If you want to do proper mentoring, it has to always be guided by goals. What is your goal in that mentoring process? So what do we talk about? Usually, we talk about what's your goal in life? What, are, what areas of your life do you want to grow? Anong goal mo? Set it up in the next few months and I, you will be accountable to me and I'll be accountable to you. You see that? So, yun lang ang ma- la- mentoring life situation ang gagawin natin. The fourth is season. This guy already knows how to lead the church, how to study on his own, but he still needs an accountability group, a peer coach, or to, to be part of a peer coaching activity to help him balance ministry and family life and special accountability. Kahit sila Kuya Philip, Dr. Ramesh, and the, uh, Pastor Al Bridges, and even Kuya Hill, all of these guys, the more they go higher in, the, in responsibility in ministry, the more they, they look for accountability groups. And that is important. So if you're a pastor, you don't have an accountability group, I want you to try and form one before you leave this conference. Maghanap ka ng accountability group mo. Alright? Any question? Oh, mamaya na yung question. Marami pa tayong pag-uusapan. Okay. okay. Let me give you some case study. How do you use this guide? Okay? Itong gami, we use this guide in this way. Sabi ni uh, Bishop Noel Panto, January 2017, nung nag-uusap kami sa Tagaytay, there are about 67,000 ch- evangelical churches. And 70% are led by pastors with no formal education. All right? That number has already changed. Uh, I just heard earlier, this uh, a while ago, it's 77,000 right now churches. 
still maybe 30% are not trained. The problem with those guesstimates, we don't have real data out of that. We lack in data jan. The last real data we have was 13 years ago, conducted by uh, I think OC, uh, uh, led by Manfred Cole. 13 years ago, sabi niya there are 50,000 evangelical churches and only 5% of our pastors has formal theological education. All right. Now, if we have proper data, then we can use it properly to understand and distribution of pastors sa atin. So in the Philippines, we have seasoned pastor, theoretical, which is about 30%. And then the rest are lay practitioners and novice. Hindi natin alam yan. Okay? Let's try if this works today. Okay? Who among you here are pastors of a church? Raise your hand. Huwag niyo bababa kami niyo. Taas niyo, please. Okay, we have almost uh, 90% of you, okay? Just raise your hand. Touch your lang, huwag niyo bababa, okay? If you had formal theological education, kung nag-aral ka ng bachelor in theology, bago ka nagpastor, pakibaba ang kamay mo. So almost about, okay, pakibaba yung kamay kung, kung, atas niyo lang, kung kayo ay may formal education bago kayo nagpastor, ha? So yung mga hin- wala, walang formal education at nag- nagpastor na kayo, taas ang kamay. Walang formal education. Yan. So that's about, that's a little bit, what, more, okay, than the estimate. So ibig sabihin, sa group natin ngayon, thank you, you can put down your hands. Sa group natin dito, mas marami yung may theological education in this group. So the, the problem, yan, perception natin yan. But in actual fact right now, we have more people who have theolog- the- uh, theological training before they became a pastor. And that's why we need your help to get the right data so that we can come up with a proper way of understanding yung situation at sa Pilipinas. Because if we have the right data, sorry? These are trainers. That's why have- These are trainers. That's why most of them are, uh, are, uh, has formal theological education. All right? But if we have the right data, we can, we can uh, come up with better strategy in the future, all right? Okay. Uh, I was in this uh, country a few, uh, a month ago. This is a restricted country. And we were running the National Global Proclamation Academy. It's a 10-day program for pastoral leaders. So yung mga pastoral leaders, sinetrain namin sila uh, for 10 days. And uh, I had about 35 uh, students, okay? None of them None of them had formal theological education. Wala kahit isa. Ang meron lang formal theological education was my interpreter. And none of them has college de- had, had any college degree. The only person who had college degree was my interpreter. That's it. So all 35 out uh, 37 uh, pastors there, lahat sila non-formal. And yet the church was growing powerfully. I met a young man there. He was a spy for that country, for that government. And while surveying, nagsusurveillance siya sa isang church, okay, he heard the gospel. And he became a Christian because of that. And now he was attending that uh, program so that he can know more how to preach properly. Okay, praise the Lord. But the Lord will use you even without formal education, but we need each other. In Japan, I was there with Dr. Ramesh last week. Okay. And we were running the same Congress, GPRO Japan. And in GPRO Japan, when we showed this to them, they said, yes, that's accurate for us. Why? 95% of the Japanese pastors had formal theological education. The problem is that their churches are not growing. 70% of their pastors are over 50 years old. 40% are 70 years old. And they estimate that they will lose two-thirds of their pastors in the next 10 years. And no one's replacing them. They have 20 evangelical seminaries. And the combined output of that 20 seminary, 22 or 23 students a year. Wala nag enroll sa kanila. And that's a big problem for the Japanese church. Now, what's the impact of non-formal theological education? You know these guys, right? They started ministry with no formal theological education. However, however, 
while doing the ministry, they began taking formal education little by little. All right? So don't, don't think now only because you started with no formal education, you will stay that way. If the Lord opens a way for you, go and take formal education. If the Lord doesn't open a way, don't worry about it because God will use you as you are. Okay? okay. Pastoral trainer's journey. So alam na natin, if you're training pastors, okay, try to categorize them in these boxes and then try to understand ano ba yung need nila and try to meet their needs. Right? Do you follow? Pero gusto namin, kayo mga pastoral trainers. Eh? So we came up with this matrix for you, pastoral trainers. So ganun din, sa pastoral training, we have two dimensions. This is adeptness, and then the other one is network of influence. So ano naman ang, net, ang adeptness? Yung adeptness is the ability of a person to create or adapt resources. Right? Meron siyang capacity na gumawa ng resources o i-adapt ang isang resources na nakuha niya sa foreign source and then gagawin niya more relevant. Alright? Yun yung ability na yun, adeptness. Yung isa naman, that's the network of influence. Meron ka bang mga uh, network na pwede mong sabihin, oh, mag-training tayo, pupunta sila dun sa training na yun. Alright? Now, Especially, uh, the first one is the specialist. If you have high adeptness and then high, high network of influence, like sila Kuya Herman Moldes, Kuya Philip Flores, of course, when you say, oh, si Kuya Philip, magta-train sa Kainos, meron na siyang network. You follow? Tapos, nagsusulat rin siya ng libro. Kaya sila, specialist. Right? But they still need platform to mentor or train additional trainers, and they still need accountability group. Right? The second one is the network. Ito majority ng Filipino, ganito eh. Okay? We have extensive network of influence and followers, but we are highly dependent on a structured training resources. So what we need, our training needs training in adapting or creating relevant and context-sensitive materials. Pero usually, kadalasan ng pastoral trainers natin, kayang mag-draw ng crowd. Alright? Yung mga network. Pero ang gagamitin nila, kung ano yung uso, yun ang tuturo nila. Dumating si Maxwell, tinuro yung uh, 21 Laws of Leadership. Sino nagturo nun dito? O, oh, nahihiya pa kayo eh. <laughs> Tapos yung iba, ginamit yung kay Rick Warren na purpose-driven program sila. Tama? So kung anong pumapasok, uh, ine-echo natin yung sa network natin. Majority of our pastors are that way. Alright? Wala naman masama doon, that's fine too. We just need to learn to contextualize the resources. So kung English yung resources, medyo mahirap kasi i-translate mo yun o gagawin mo na intindihan ng mga group mo, okay, ng, ng church nyo. The other one is innovator. Okay, yung innovator naman, pag tinignan nyo yung journey matrix, okay, sila yung mga may trading, formal theological training, pero wala naman nakakakilala sa kanila. Ito, we fall under that. Eh. Dito ako nag start Kasi we write programs, uh, we develop programs for pastoral trainers, pero wala naman nakakakilala sa amin because we don't have any network. And usually, for innovators, we need platform or connection or vetting yung mga magsasabi, oh, okay yan, kunin nyo siya. From those with established network of influence. So, dun sa mga may network of influence at may nakikita kang taong, oh, magaling rin to, gumagawa ng material, Go ahead and partner with them and bring them into uh, the ministry para rin siya magkaroon ng network and he can help you out, both of you. Do you follow? Ang problema, konti lang yung mga networks, uh, innovators sa atin. Majority are network. And you saw later, anong difference? And then the first one is the aspirant. Yung aspirant, ito yung mga nag sa pa lang sa pastoral training at wala pa siya masyadong network. So kung yung network ng pastors mo, katulad ko, okay, my immediate network are those three guys. So I'm just starting, aspirant. But I'm able to uh, create some resources, so I move towards innovator. We're hoping that later on, as the Lord bless our ministry and our relationship, the network grows little by little over time, and then maybe 20, 30 years from now, you can stand like Kuya Philip, ministering to a wider body of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the journey. Journey nga yan, eh, okay? Journey of pastoral trainers. So saan kayo dyan? Hopefully, you can identify yourself in one of those boxes. Tama? And then you know what you need to do in order to develop. Okay. So let's go to the 
distribution of pastoral trainers in economically stronger nations. So sa mga bansa ng US, for example, in the US, Australia, or Britain, usually, if uh, a pastoral trainers come from that country, usually, most of them are specialists and innovators. Kasi may training sila eh. Kukunti sa kanilang network at aspirant who would go and trade in other countries. You follow? So for example, Bruce Wilkinson came here. Before Bruce Wilkinson came here for the World Teach Conference, he already has a network. He already developed wonderful materials for the program. Okay? So ganun talaga yung, pro, yung mga type ng mga trainers who comes from different countries there because they have the funding and the ability to do it. Okay? Sa atin naman, in weaker economic nations, economically weaker nations, the majority of pastoral trainers fall under network and the aspirants. Ibang mga gusto talaga nila mag-train, okay? Minsan parang questionable yung training, pero marami pa rin nag-aaten. Okay. And because we have that network. So what we need, anong gagawin natin? Marami tayong seminary trained guys, we encourage seminary trained guys to try to become an innovator. Why? Because majority of our resources, majority of the resources on pastoral training benefits the season and the theoretical. Kasi sila nagsusulat eh. They're the ones writing pro, uh, books, material. Sino, si, kanino nila susulat to? Para sa mga kasama nila. So kung seminary graduate ka, di ba? Susulat ka ng libro, para kanino? Sa katulad mo ring graduate ng seminary. Ang problema dyan, we need trading materials for this group. Those people who lack theological training, we need more materials for them. You follow? So, kayo, kayo ay may seminary graduate, um, seminary degree, we encourage you to build simple materials, relevant materials for our context. Okay? Ano pa? Majority of pastoral resources are written by foreign authors. Right? We need Filipino resources written by Filipino authors so that it's more contextual and relevant to our situation. Right? Majority of the resources we're doing, anong ginagawa natin? We take a resource from another country, we translate that, and then we use it. But it's better if, if our people write our own program and resources for our own people. Because it's more meaningful, it's more relevant, and context sensitive. Alright? A vast majority of directors and content creators of non-formal pastoral training programs come from formal theological institution. So, raise your hand again. If you are training pastors or mentoring pastors, can you please raise your hand? Okay. Now, please put down your hand kung wala kang formal theological education. Wala. Wala. Okay. Thank you. So, all of the pastoral trainers has formal theological education. So, that's where we need each other. If you are not formally trained, that's fine because you have a brother who can help you out in building you up. So, wag tayong mag-away. Okay? Because we need each other. And usually, those people who are always in the library reading books, usually, they have very few mentors too. So, what they need is to learn from people who are doing mentoring job and discipleship and who are more effective in church planting because we need to balance ourselves in both. Okay? Let me give you some examples of trading programs happening in the Philippines. One of them is Asian Access. Uh, this is a two-year program. Okay, just to give you examples, ano pwede niyong gawin? What can you develop in your own programs? Okay, yan. Uh, this uh, Asian Access meets once every three months, every quarter for four days. Okay, they meet together for two years. So what happens? The mentoring program, accountability program, and relationship nagdi deepen within this group, and we're hoping that this community builds each other up. You can also design your own program this way. Okay, the longer, the more. Uh, uh, many intervals are, I mean, many, you, you meet more often, it's better for the community. Okay. Uh, this is Bible School on Wheels. This program is, be, will be launched next year formally, but we already have this here. Bible School on Wheels was start, is uh, developed by Dr. Bruce Wilkinson. And this program is for regular church leaders, right? It uh, involves a box, in box na yan, pag binili mo yan, meron kang fifth, uh, 10 books that is uh, that you can use for 10 liters and it has five DVDs you bought DVD na yan, you can watch it for eight hours each DVD you can train them for the next year, the whole year using that program 
Okay? So, and another thing, we have the Timothy Initiative. It's another two-year program. It also meets the same way, three months at a time. We're not involved with the Timothy Initiative, but they're a good friend with GPRO Commission. And um, itong Timothy Initiative, they meet uh, four times a year, two years din yan, but at the end of the year, you have to have a church. At mataas ang attrition rate nila. Right? Halimbawa, nag-attend kayo, 100 kayo nag-attend. After two years, ang matitira lang doon, lima lang. But you can be sure that out of that five, you have five churches after two years. That's how effective they are. They only, they started 2011. Okay? What's that? No, 2007. They started 2007. Uh, 11 years after, they have more than 50,000 churches around the world. Timothy Initiative. You can Google that. The game is a Google. Timothy Initiative. If you go to the website, you'll see there the number of churches that they're able to plan. Okay? So these are programs you can invite, you can ask us about, you can develop yourself. These are just models that you can develop. This is another program I've been um, uh, involved for the last 11 years. I've been part of this program since 2006. So 12 years. Uh, first time I joined this program was in Dallas. And then after that, I was, uh, little by little, I was, uh, began, began to be part of this program. And this is a 10-day program for younger leaders, pastoral leaders. So you can develop similar programs depending on the needs of your people. Okay. So here's another matrix for you to use. It's called the Pastoral Trainers Needs Assessment Matrix. So, sabi na natin gusto mo mag-train. Okay? You want to train, you want to develop a team, and you want to uh, bring them out to train other people. Sometimes, you don't understand kung ano yung, yung needs ng group na yon. And this can ha somehow help you assess yung situation before you go in and train people. All right? Down here, it's called language or literacy gap. Okay? And then up there is the economic gap. Okay? Nagkabalik tad lang, I'm sorry, okay? This should be uh, low. That should be high. Okay? Pakilipat ho yung sa notes niyo. This is low, that's high. That's low, this is high. Okay? Please change it. Okay, I'll explain it. If you're trying to minister, alimbawa ako, Tagalog, uh, Manila, okay? Gusto ko mag-minister sa mga kapatiran kong pastor sa Bulacan, Okay? Yung language gap namin, hindi masyadong malayo. Lalo na kung medyo uh, college degree holders yung mga pastor, yung literacy gap namin, hindi rin malayo. Low. Okay? Low literacy gap. At dahil sa may pera naman sila magbayad ng seminar, hindi katulad dito, kailangan libre, kasi hindi kayo, <laughs> di, biro lang, biro lang, bato-bato sa langit, matamaan, ay wag mag- Okay? Ang ibig sabihin nun, Difficulty one level ka lang. Right? Kaya mo bang gawin yon Training? Kaya? Yes, madali lang. Kasi wala kang problema sa pera, wala ka rin problema sa literacy or language gap. Do you follow? O, pa -ta -ta paano naman pag mag-minister kami sa uh, medyo rural area sa Pilipinas? Okay? Wala kami masyadong problema sa language barrier. Okay? Philip. Pilipinas pa rin. Pero sometimes, yung mga ibang pastor sa ibang rural area, they cannot pay for the conference fee. So ngayon, may difficulty level ka na konti kasi now you have to raise a little bit money. Tama? Okay. Yung level 3 of difficulty, ito mahirap. Okay? For example, we were in Japan a few days ago. Sa Japan, we don't have problems with the economic gap because they can pay for the transportation and for the, for the lodging. The problem there is that we have to hire, we have to get a translator to help us with all the materials pati sa, sa preaching, right? So the difficulty level is actually uh, more difficult, level three. And then if you're ministering, I, we ministered in uh, Vietnam uh, some time ago, and that's difficulty level is four because we have to get translators, get people to help us with the language barrier, and then we have to raise our funds too to get there. Because of the economic gap. Do you follow? Is this helpful for you? Yes. Makakatulong? Okay. It's good. Okay. <clears throat> we'll move there. And then finally, we'd like to encourage, show, show to you the pastoral leader's life stage journey. Okay. Ano bang ibig sabihin nito? 
We have this life stage underneath and dun yung economic needs niya. Anong pangangailangan niya habang nag-grow siya is moving towards this life stage. Oftentimes, when you get data from pastors, ang gagawin nyo, anong, pa, uh, anong edad mo, okay? But telling us your age doesn't help us understand your situation. Kasi maaring 50 ka na, pang single ka naman, wala ka namang issue masyado sa pangangailangan mo, tama? So dapat life stage. Yung life stage, whatever age they are, kung siya ay single, ang need niya, economically, mababa lang. Alright? Ha, pag nagpakasal na siya, tumataas. Pag siya ay married with young kids, married with teenage kids, married with working kids, tatrabaho na yung anak, mga anak niya, o kaya kids with family, may apo na siya, retired, baka malapit, lagyan na rin natin divorce, kung maaprubahan yung divorce law, pero, okay? This thing is helpful if you talk to your elders too. Because our, when you're deciding the kind of pastor you want to hire sa church ninyo, ano nangyari, yung mga pastor, minsan, I-hire mo yung pastor sa ganitong income level pero yung life stage niya nandito. Hindi magtatagal yung pastor mo. Tama? Kasi may pangangailangan siya eh. You have to meet his need. So if you're hiring a pastor, make sure na you understand nasan ba siya sa life stage niya and if you hire a pastor in this stage, actually mas mababa yung kailangan mong ibigay sa kanyang bayad. Okay? Now, how does this work? Sa Pilipinas... I think, we think. Okay, wala tayong hard data, okay? Perception lang natin. Majority of the pastors, maybe, maybe, falls under single, married, married with young kids. Alright? Tama kaya? Sa ibang denomination, hindi. Mas mababa yung, past, yung, yung number ng pastors nila who are younger. Okay? But generally, it, it seems like, it looks like this. But, in Japan, and we showed this in Japan, they said, yes, that's true. Okay? The problem with Japan is that majority of the pastors are in this stage and nobody is going to replace them. Okay? So what we need is to keep on building those younger pastors so that we make sure that yung, as they grow in life, the younger they are, the whole, more time they can journey with the church and the healthier the church will be. All right? So... Implications for pastoral training in the Philippines, we need topic commission, tong commission natin, to become an advocate for pastoral health. We need the topic commission to develop studies for informed decisions. Ang problema sa mga pinakita naming slides sa inyo, we don't have raw data. It's good to get raw data so that we can all come up with a good strategy later on. Okay? We need to encourage more partnership and sharing of resources. We need to build up Filipino scholars to develop more pastoral training resources. Problema sa maraming Filipino scholars, they focus too much on theological ideas that only a handful of people will read. Ang kailangan namin to challenge uh, theologians to write relevant materials for pastoral training. And we need to encourage formal and informal institutions to work together. May we see the hands of those who are representing formal theological, theological institutions, please? Meron ba? A few of them are here. Praise the Lord for people who are coming from formal theological education. And we need you to help us bridge this gap between formal and non-formal theological education. So according to Malcolm Weber of Leader Source, an effective pastoral training program focuses on five C's. Character, calling, competence, commitment, or Christ, and community. Okay? So that means if you are a pastoral trainer, you're trying to develop a program for pastoral leaders. You can focus on these subjects and develop it. But you know what? Okay, listen to me. Excuse me. The most important for me, the most important, critical of all these five is community. Because it is in deep community where all of these are developed. Okay? You develop your calling, your character, competence, commitment in a community. Apart from a community, you cannot develop that. Paano kung may de-develop yung character mo? Ayaw makapaghalubilo. Kung naiinis ka, umaalis ka lang sa simbahan. Hindi walang development ng character. No, you can't. The church was created as a community. The more you have a community, you can develop those in a community. No one becomes like Christ apart from a community. Sige nga, basahin mo lahat ng theology apart from a community. 
Basahin mo lahat ng Bible, yung Bible mo, cover to cover, without a community, you cannot express what it means to be a Christian. You agree? Hindi mo pwedeng, hindi ka pwedeng mag-express, hindi ka pwedeng lumago as a Christian without a community. So you need a community to develop this. Okay? Apart from that, you cannot be a good Christian. You can be a good leader, you cannot practice it apart from community. Kaya nga may simbahan eh. Remember, the one that raises leaders is the church, not the seminaries. Okay? It is the community of believers that raises leaders. The seminaries are there just to enhance their skill, their calling, their capacity. But the one who really raises and produces leaders are churches. And you have to have communities. For me, the most important in that thing is commitment. You express, I mean, a community. You express your commitment in Christ in a community setting. You can express your competence in a community. You can express your calling in a community. You can develop your character in a community. Right? Okay. And then, if you're asking, ano ba yung top 10 most requested seminar topics? Ano ba yung mga topic na hinihingi ng mga pastor? We did this about, I think, last year with, uh, with uh, PCEC sa Davao. And this is what they came up, the 10 most requested seminars according to importance. The first one, mentoring and discipleship, yun ang hinihingi ng churches. Second, forgiveness, restoration, church discipline, maybe church uh, conflict resolution. The fourth is biblical stewardship and financial literacy. Then church administration and management, leadership and developing leaders. Actually, parang pareho lang yan sa mentoring and discipleship. Family and fatherhood and married life. Basic theology, apologetics and advanced preaching. Pastoral counseling, intimacy with God. And church planting and missions. Those are the things that they ask topic usually to teach. Okay. Requested. Okay. Uh, this is our proposal for the meantime. Because we don't have the right data, we need to get the right data. At dahil sa meron ng sinet ang PCC by 2020, they will, they will finish their goal of 120 vision, yung, yung vision 120 nila, by 2020. Let's just follow that program for a while para may unity tayo sa body, okay? Since we don't have the right data, we will use the sex two years to come up with data that we just suggested. But within the, the two years, we will gather data from you, and then after two years, we will agree to meet together again. That's not okay. October again, 2020. And then we can come up with proper data. And then for the next five years, we can plan ahead better. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So, gagawin natin ganito. Because there's about, uh, this is the mission uh, statement of topic. Topic commission exists to champion the well-being of past Filipino pastoral leaders by, what? Read it with me. Mobilizing pastoral training institutions and individuals. Second, mentoring pastoral trainers. Third, monitoring pastoral and church health indicators for future strategic decisions. Yun ang ginagawa natin. So that in the next few years, we know what we're doing. Pero bear with us for the next two years, gagamitin lang natin ang mga data that we can find, guesstimate lang. Hopefully, two years from now, we can come up with a better data for us to plan longer term. Is that okay? Tatapusin lang natin yung vision ng PCC Vision 120, 2020, and then 2020, we will meet again to come up with changes sa direction natin. This is the faith goals for the next two years for Topic Commission. We envision to raise 5,000 new pastoral trainers. Kayo po yun. Ilan lang tayo dito? 100 plus. We want to raise that around the world, uh, around the Philippines to 5,000 new pastoral trainers. Now, we don't want you to do what we used to do before. Anong gagawin namin? Pupunta kami sa isang bayan, magtuturo, aalis. Bala na kayo dyan. Until the next trainer comes and teach them, aalis. Walang continuity, walang accountability. Okay? What we want to do is that when we raise 5,000 new pastoral trainers, we're actually raising 5,000 pastoral health communities with them. So pag sinabi mong, Pastor, I want to be a pastoral trainer under topic, yes, but we want you also to commit to us that you will develop a community, of accountable, accountability community, the, we can call it core, walang problema ron, we can also call it pastoral health communities. 
ilan? Limang tao. At least lima kayo. Ikaw, apat na tao. For the next two years. I-gather mo sila. It doesn't have to be a pastor. Some of them could be a, a rising leader. Developing leader pa lang. Emerging leader sa group mo. Kunin mo sila sa group mo with the intention of challenging them, encouraging them to become a pastoral leader later. Right? Do you follow? So gusto namin ilan? 5,000 of you. We are encouraging you to become a new pastoral trainer. So how do you do that? Check the matrix, see where you are, and try to address your need. Okay? Madali lang yan, eh, di ba? Nandito ako, I can do this, and I can partner so that I become a pastoral trainer. And then you commit to reach out to four other pastors or at least emerging leaders in your group. And we want you to be regularly for the next two years. Why? Because pastoral health is developed in community. Okay? You can read, you can, you can study theology, you can encourage one another in community. All right? And then, okay, out of that 5,000, if you have four, 5,000 times four, ilan? Ilan? Siyempre, pastor kayo, hindi nyo masagot. Kaya ka nagpastor, eh, hindi ka nag-engineer. <laughs> 20,000, di ba? 20,000. 5,000 times 4, 20,000 people that we're trying to connect with. Pero, we know for sure that there's attrition rate. Yung mga hindi magtutuloy. Siyempre, yung iba, gustong iba yung gawin, cannot commit with you, that's fine. But we're putting, at the meantime, 50% attrition rate. Dun sa apat na i-coconnect mo, yung iba doon, yung dalawa doon, baka hindi magpatuloy, dalawa lang. Kahit na dalawa lang ang magpatuloy, we still hit the goal nila Kuya Philip na 10,000 new pastoral leaders by the next two years. Alright? Madali lang iset yan. Ang problema, the biggest work right now is tomorrow. Kasi bukas, ang tanong, how do we reach that goal? Yun ang gagawin natin tomorrow. Alright? We will divide the group tomorrow and uh, Kuya Lito and... Pastor Nixon will come in uh, tomorrow and will tell you what to do. Pero hindi divide natin sa formal, the non-formal. Sa mga formal naman, if you are from Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, you group together. Yung Luzon, mas marami kayo, we will divide you maybe into three groups, right? So you can join. And then for the others who are not part of topic, you will have your own group as well. Okay? Tapos bibigyan namin kayo yung mga assignments tomorrow on what to do. How do we reach this goal? Okay, and we will need your commitment to give us commitment and say, Pastor, I'm committing this much number of pastors that we want to train and reach out in the next two years. Okay? Last. Our next GPRO Pastoral Trainer Summit natin ay 2020 na October. Dito na lang din muna natin gawin. Alright? Is that okay? Pakiblock na yung uh, maybe second or third week ninyo. And then we will come back here. Hopefully, two years from now, we will have a better data than this one. Okay? Now, remember, when we talk about GPRO, we're talking about the events for pastoral leaders and pastoral trainers. When we talk about topic, yun po ang nagtatrain ng pastoral trainers. Okay? We're training pastoral trainers, we'll talk about topic. That's what topic is doing. Nagtatrain kami ng pastoral trainers so that we can train as many people as we can. If the rate is true. If the guesstimate is true, the 30% of our, what, 70 plus thousand pastors uh, have limited formal theological education, then we need more pastoral trainers to reach them out. And the best way to make sure that they're healthy is to involve them in a community of pastors. Okay, thank you for listening and we'll take questions.